This also is uh, called challenging norms. I thought that it was important to focus on the ways that the things that were snuck into the program were in fact challenging the norms of the day and should have been deleted, but the higher ups at the studio didn't quite understand what was going on. And to me, that's really interesting. So um, obviously, challenging norms, and as it was titled in the um, abstract, how can you censor what you can't understand? So that's how the young writers on the show, and these are the young writers, although they don't all look that young in these photographs, but these were the writing staff <laughs> of the monkeys. Uh, Gerald Gardner had come from being a speechwriter for uh, Robert Kennedy's senatorial campaign in New York, and then he got into satirical television and did Get Smart. Uh, Dave Evans had come out of uh, Bullwinkle, and so he had that sort of funny animation background. Uh, Bernie Ornstein worked for Hollywood Palace. Peter Meyerson and Treva Silverman were the actual hippies on the show. They willingly admitted, and I interviewed all these people in their 80s in their homes in LA. Mm -hmm. They willingly admitted smoking pot in their office and being part of that new wave culture and enjoying the power of that. Um, and Meyerson eventually married Mike Nesmith's third wife in their life. So they were all intertwined with each other. Um, and what I talk about with the monkeys is that everyone gets wrapped up in the music. And I, I love the music, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the innovation of the television program, which people do forget in its premiere season won two Emmy Awards for Best New Comedy Series and Best Director in a Comedy Series. And that director was Jim Frawlin, who grew up to direct The Muppets and many other films. So we had great talent working on this program. Um, Paul Wazerski and Larry Tucker wrote the pilot and then walked away due to a dispute with the producers who also used the money and the profits from the monkeys to create the 60s independent film world of five TV pieces and, um, and Jack Nicholson is the writer of the monkeys movie Head. So that whole world kind of the money came out of this show and that's where the power of the show came from. Um, but I will get situated really briefly, you probably know most of this stuff, but um, this was an era when people were highly censored in American television. And this is what I think is interesting, how the monkeys awarded this. So just briefly, we know the Smothers Brothers were canceled eventually for too much discussion of Vietnam. They didn't allow Pete Seeger to sing Waste Deep in Big Money because that was about Vietnam, so that was banned from television. Barbara Eden was banned from showing us her navel because that would be far too sexual on television. On um, that girl, we, weren't, we were always made to see Donald, her shutting the door on Donald at the end of a date, so we never could imagine they spent the night together. So this is that girl, which is Marlo Thomas, Danny Thomas' daughter, right? And um, this is famously Star Trek, the first interracial kiss on television. The only way they were allowed to do that was they were being manipulated by greater alien beings, <laughs> and they didn't, they didn't want to. But Shatner didn't want to insult Michelle Nichols by saying he wouldn't choose to kiss her. So the way the actors worked it out in the book on Star Trek is uh, because he was her superior. It was mm -hmm. wrong. So from a military standpoint, that's how the actors allowed themselves to accept that they weren't supposed to want to kiss. And finally, also on Star Trek, uh, this particular costume caused the censors to put someone on the set to make sure that it never slipped because it was, um, it was illegal or impossible to show the underside of a female breast on television. So this is the kind of world that the monkeys are in. Some is earlier, some is later. Um, some people may or may not know that censorship goes a lot of ways. When Judgment at Nuremberg was aired on the Playhouse 90, which is before the monkeys by 10 years, uh, they were not allowed to mention gas chambers because the American Gas Association did not want to be insulted by American television. So we, we did an entire story about Nazis and murder, and we never mentioned gas chambers. So censorship takes many forms, and in this period, it was very prevalent. Uh, in the 70s and later, we'll hit into the fact that Maude was the first woman to acceptably have an abortion on television when it was legal in New York, but not fully in the States. Um, I worked on 90210 when Andrea Zuckerman wrote the episode where she went to Planned Parenthood to decide whether or not to have an abortion. Uh, we were going to be allowed to do it, but the actress wanted to be pregnant on television. She didn't want to hide behind boxes. So, so we weren't, in the end, she chose not to, but we at least got to discuss that it was a, an a, a acceptable option. And of course, Christina Yang on Ray's Anatomy is the latest woman to actually choose to have one and get away with it. So all this stuff is on television. Also, just post the monkeys, we're gonna have 30 something. And there was a, 
the two gay gentlemen. This scene was banned in the South. Several states in the South wouldn't show that episode because they refused to accept that, which so I think is crazy. So was the interracial kiss on Star Trek. So yes, exactly, but in the South. Um, of course, we know because of the Hayes Code coming into television, we ended up with Lucy and Ricky in separate beds, even though they were married and they had a baby, which is funny. Um, and then we end up with the you know, first couple in television allowed to share a bed were Carol and Mike Brady and the Brady Bunch. Uh, because they were previously married to other people and had children, so I guess it was acceptable that they had once had sex, they could share a bed. <laughs> I have no idea why they made that decision, but we always think that's funny. Which brings me back to my boys, who shared separate beds in their head in Malibu, but when they traveled, they all slept in the same bed together, and nobody made anything out of that in television in the 1960s. So go figure. All right, so on the monkeys, they had a lot of things that the, were uncensored, that were, were not stopped. And it's these things, what they discussed on the program, and I'm going to show some examples of all that. Uh, and then something I'm going to discuss that I think is new to my take on it, which is obviously in my book, and I don't expect people to buy my book, but it's always lovely if you ask your local library to order. <laughs> 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 That's how I get all the books in my library. Mm. Um, but uh, it, it's an idea of implicit bias and how it kept an African-American perspective from television, but they slid that into the monkeys in a different fashion, which I'll get to in a second. So first of all, they were actually recognized by many people for getting away with things they shouldn't, including Timothy Leary, who wrote in one of his early books, this whole program, this is a jolly Buddha laugh at hypocrisy. And if you really get it, you're in tune, right? Um, I really like this concept right here. The more manufactured, which is what they're nailed for, they're a manufactured group, it easier it was for the actors or writers to use the new energies to sing the new songs and pass on the new message. And it was a message, and people dismissed it because they were funny and silly and potentially bubblegum, and for children. But those 13-year-olds who were their fans are going to be 18 in the 70s, and they're going to be resisting the draft. And they're going to learn that it's okay to disobey from watching these guys do that. So I think that's pretty interesting. Likewise, um, in Timothy Leary's book, he references Mickey and many of the rants he would give and then his references, pretty good talking for a long-haired weirdo, huh? And one of the funny things is he was censored in the first season, they ironed his hair. Because an afro <laughs> is inappropriate for a, a white man on television. So he ironed for the first year, and the second year he said, I'm tired of that, and they let him stop. <laughs> so I think that's funny. Uh, all right, so some of the things they got away with doing. In this particular episode, Monkey Mother, which is written by Peter Meyerson, the gentleman I pointed to, the hippie guy, and starred Rosemary, who I love. There's a scene of it where they're playing dominoes. And it's just the intro to a scene. It's a very little throwaway moment. As they knock all the dominoes down, Davy Jones asks Peter Tork, what do you call this game? And Peter Tork says, Southeast Asia. <laughs> 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 Domino theory and Johnson's American politics. That's clear, and it stayed in the program. Nobody stopped and thought that they were insulting the President of the United States, which I think is hilarious. Um, and you can't see the title of this. This is um, uh, Monkeys Watch Their Feet. It's by a guy named Coslo Johnson, whose piece I didn't, uh, picture I didn't have. He went on to get an Emmy for writing a laugh in. He's Artie Johnson's brother. Uh, and he's adorable. I just love it. He's like an elf to have lunch with. Uh, anyway, he wrote this episode, which is all about the Vietnam War. How they got around this again, I have no idea. It begins with aliens invading America, and this lovely, of course, picture of the flag, and Mike Nesmith is explaining what's going on. And Pat Paulson, who will eventually be on Laugh-In, says this of what's wrong with the youth of America. All right? Just at the moment, we're getting ready to start. Uh, and he describes Mickey, that character, as being tormented by a war he must fight in a country thousands of miles away. And this is what's wrong with the youth of America, right? And this is about an alien invasion. So in a lovely way, the show was so innovative that it was never one thing. People think it was a rom-com every week where Davy Jones fell in love. They did sci-fi episodes, they did, um, they did romances, they did westerns, they did every genre they could possibly fit because it was all free-for-all, whatever they wanted. So this is an alien episode, which is a great way to reflect on the so war. What date was that? Was that? 66 to 68. Uh, this I love from the Associated Press, when they were going to draft Davy Jones, fan clubs all over <laughs> England <laughs> did parades and insisted that you couldn't take him away from us. Uh, but they're describing the war again. We're not fighting. That must be those crazy kids. They're the ones doing all the fighting. I mean, this isn't an anti-Vietnam statement. I have no idea. And this is 1967. This is the height of the drafting in America. 
So I think that's pretty funny. So that episode is very political. And they did that quite often. This one is one I use with students. I, it's the very last episode of the show. It's called Frodo's Caper. It was written by Dolans and Dave Evans, the guy from Bullwinkle. Uh, and I can't believe the guy. The students never understand how they got away with this. Uh, it's an episode about this television set, this eye, which is taking over the brains of all the people in their neighborhood. So first of all, we're discussing television being a terrible drug for people on television. So we're making fun of ourselves and our product. But what gets crazier is the song they introduce in this particular episode is Zorin Zan, which is a deeply anti-war song. I have to take a piece peek at the lyrics. I don't have to sing them for you. But I do love the ending. Two little kings playing a game. They gave a war and nobody came. Right, which is a very, they have a lot of very, obviously, peace, peace movement ideas built into the show. This scene is actually from Head, not from the show, but I liked it because they're in uniform. So in Frodo's Caper, we've got a television taking over the minds of America, right? And our young boys are going to save the day because that's what they do. What happens is, by the end of the day, they've discovered the eye belongs to a plant. And it's not a bad plant. It's a good plant that's been taken over by other men who are using its powers for bad. And this is a very terrible thing. So our heroes save the plant in that Zorn Zam music montage. They run it up a hill in Griffith Park, which is always fun to see the locations, to its spaceship, where it recharges its Frodus power. And Frodus is an urban word for marijuana. <laughs> and this evil villain, the evil villains were always in their 40s or 50s, so the bad people were always that generation of parents. The old people in their 70s were always good people, and the young people were always good, right? <laughs> so the wizard Glick gets a whiff of the power of the Frodus and has this to say for himself. <laughs> and this is the Frodus, which they carry through the streets and save the day with. <laughs> Meanwhile, if you look at an urban dictionary, Frodus is a word for marijuana. And it was invented by Mickey Dolenz because of his love for Tolkien mm -hmm. and Frodo mm -hmm. and getting into that mindset you want to be in when you read Tolkien, apparently. They were all reading it at the time. When you were but Tolkien. When you were, well, there you go, when you were talking, that's probably not very true. So, I mean, the fact that they got away with that, again, and nobody stopped them. And when my students figure out, and we tend, in Orange County, we tend to have some conservative young students. They're always shocked to think that people could talk about marijuana as not a bad thing. Right? And in 1967. Uh, all right, then they have lots of drug jokes along the way. This particular one I always think is adorable. And again, slid through the censors. <laughs> yeah, they do love flashbacks. This one is also good. In order to bring people back from the dead, I've invented a magnificent pill. I get it, you see, he gives us the pill, and we believe that Elba came back from the dead. But we also see pretty colors and things like the wall. So, they make many references. Then there's an episode where as soon as he says that, they do this lovely fake fantasy scene. That's a trip. Mm -hmm. Only they knew the code words they were including, and that trip obviously meant something to their generation, that it didn't mean to the censors who went, well, there's nothing wrong with that. They're talking about a trip, so what the heck? <laughs> This episode I really love. It's called The Devil and Peter Tork. It's the second one I usually teach. Uh, it's by Gardner, who did the speech writing for um, Kennedy, and his partner Caruso and um, Kaufman. In this one, this is a whole um, Dr. Faustus. Peter sells his soul for the right to play the harp beautifully, and it makes them a famous band because the harp is a gorgeous thing in a rock band. I don't know why. But what's funny about the episode in terms of censoring is in this moment, they're all describing hell. But every time one of them mentions it, they're bleeped. Because, of course, you can't say hell on television. We all know George Carlin and the seven dirty words you can't say on television. Uh, until we get to the metatextual moment where each of them has spoken, and Mickey Dolan says, you know what's really crazy? You can't say bleep on television. <laughs> and everyone falls on the floor, and they've directly addressed the censorship and the fact that they're being stopped from saying that. What makes me laugh is, in this particular episode, the network was going to um, censor the song Salesman, which plays over the dream of what hell is like because they thought it was a song about drug sales. But never in that song did they mention drugs at all. But in the whole of Frodo's Caper, we do nothing but glorify the marijuana. And somehow they, didn't, they wanted to get rid of the one song. And from a feminist standpoint, which I'll get to also in a moment, it makes me laugh because they didn't have a problem with the girls' outfits. Somehow Playboy bunnies are what you find when you go to hell, which doesn't seem to be a bad thing, apparently. 
So I always thought that was kind of sad. That's their version of how. Um, all right, so speaking of feminists, I had a little moment there because I think it's really interesting the challenging of norms, and these were not things that would have been censored, but this moves into the challenging norms territory. As I said, the show has seemed to be always a love story for Davy Jones. What I found when I looked at all 58 episodes is every one of the women they fell in love with had a job or was going to school. Every one of these women is a feminist in the 1960s. They are taking care of themselves. If they're in school, they care about their grades. This girl gives up a date with Davy because she has to study for a history test. Who in America would give up a date with Davy Jones to study for a history test? Julie Newmar um, works in a laundry. I mean, that's not a brilliant job, but she has a job. She takes care of herself. So and these are biker chicks over here, which is kind of funny. But I thought that was really adorable. And even the, the de rigueur necessary princess, the princess Bettina of Harmonica, uh, is offered the chance to stay in LA and live with Davy Jones. And she says no, because she has a duty to her people and she must return and fulfill the obligation that her parents have given her. So to me, there's a huge feminist streak that is challenging the normal woman on television. Um, because I would say that as a child watching this, what I learned was that if I wanted to date a monkey, I had to be a girl of substance. I couldn't be some <laughs> poofy little, there's no cheerleaders here. There's no ditzy little blonde girls doing anything. So to me, that's an area where they challenge norms. Partially, and I interviewed Treva Silverman, her influence, right? She's a female writer and staff. She was the first solo woman to write comedy in America without a male partner on a TV show. Uh, and she would go on to win an Emmy for Mary Tyler Moore where she wrote the episode where um, Lou Grant's wife asked for a divorce. And so she's a pretty brilliant writer and this was her first major gig. Anyway, the other thing the show did that was fascinating, and again, I don't know how they got away with it, at the end of several episodes, every three or four episodes, they would be short a minute. And so they would just go off on the set and interview the guys and let them talk about whatever happened to be on their mind at the time. And I'm going to show you a clip from one of those interviews at the end because of the things they talk about. They talk about the civil rights movement. They talk about their own hippie culture and why it's so important. They talk about a thing called the Sunset Curfew Riots in Los Angeles. And they talk about how they were mistreated for being men with long hair at the time, which was obviously disliked. The Sunset Strip Riots were in events at a place called Pandora's Box, which was a, a club in LA, and LA put in a curfew. If you were uh, not 21, you couldn't stay out past 10 o'clock, which means you couldn't come to clubs. So there were riots, if you want to call them that, just kids marching the streets, nothing you know, terribly bad happened, but it was children disobeying the adults when they made a rule, and how dare. And so the, the boys will talk about that in a little clip of the show. They got involved in politics. This is Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart. They wrote most of the songs for the monkeys. And in the early 70s, they wrote um, Let Us Vote, love, the love movement, because of course we were moving from a vote at the age of 21 to a vote at the age of 18. So and the show itself had political movements, and as they continued, the guys did. Now here's my new thought about what they got away with on this program that changed some things in television. Uh, because I'm Italian, I love to read stuff about Italians in America and their influence. And in all these books, I started reading about something that I never noticed as a kid, which was that Italian Americans often stand in for African American characters. And this is my lovely example. It's Louis Prima doing the voice of King Louis in the Jungle Book. Often, Italian actors played people of that kind, right? People who were African American. Um, even Stephen Van Zandt would talk about the rascals and say, to be white and sound that black, you've got to be Italian. So there's this blending of these two cultures. Mickey Dolenz is, if we did this show in the 70s, he would have been a black actor. We're going to move into a period where we'd have more African Americans. He would do James Brown music in all their concerts and mimic James Brown. Um, he was described as having a gospel sound to his voice, which is, again, something in African American. He invited Jimi Hendrix to open their concerts. And Hendrix toured with them for about eight concerts. And if you think I'm lying, there it is. <laughs> Nobody believes it. They were all friends. They had a good time. Because of his existence in the program, I would claim that we make room for Freddie Prinz and J.G. Dynamite Walker and all that as we come into the 70s. We open the door for African Americans. Peter Tork says this, the show probably garnered a larger audience for their point of view because, than the Beatles because TV exposure meant more people. You had money. You had to have money for a Beatles album or music. But on TV, they came to you every week. Treva says they got away with it, which I think is a funny quote because all the executives could accessorize the accessories, but they never got the point. <laughs> they thought they were cool when they were not, which I think is pretty cool. So what I'm going to do is quickly get to the clip, because I think it's a fun clip to hear them talk for themselves. No, not that one, this one. 
So, this is one of those after show interviews. Picture that have fights in it and uh, gangsters and everything. You ever get into fights yourselves? So we had an incident in Hawaii where somebody uh, remarked about my hair. Uh, so what? My hair being long, you know? Yeah. And there was like 10 big guys <laughs> and little old me. Are you sensitive about that? Um, I'm not sensitive, for, you know, if it's like, you know, in jest, somebody yeah. laughs and says, you know, it's just one thing, but if they carry on about it, it makes me mad. If you went into a restaurant and uh, they, you know, refused to wait on you because of your hair or something like that, you know, are you quick to strike back? I invoke my constitutional rights. <laughs> and what do you do? You leave? No, I go. I invoke the Civil Rights Act. But there's been a lot of talk about the riots that have been going on in Sunset Strip. There was a riot. You know, there was a lot of vandalism. There haven't really been riots. They've been, as, in actuality, since I since I was there, they've been demonstrations, and. Uh, but I guess a lot, a lot of people and uh, journalists don't know how to spell demonstrations, so they, they use the word riot. <laughs> <laughs> First, tell me a little bit what, quickly, what are the demonstrations and who's taking place in them? Well, it's mostly the kids um, that are uh, from the ages of about 15 to, I'd say, 20 or 21. Uh, under 18, it's a California law that uh, you're not able to go into a teenage nightclub uh, that sells uh, alcoholic beverage. There's a 10 o'clock curfew imposed on these young people that uh, uh, regardless of whether it's a, a good thing or a bad thing, uh, they still don't like it. I think it probably has a lot to do with the fact that uh, uh, of somebody telling them they have to be in by 10 o'clock. Um, that's sort of the same thing as saying that they have to cut their hair. You know, I mean, it's it's against the law to tell somebody they can do that. Which Would you like to see all thing. the kids in the country wearing hair like yours? I would like to see all the kids in the country wearing the hair like they'd like to wear it. How do you feel? How many? How do you feel about that? Exactly. exactly. Well, I'm with you. I'm with you. And when it first <laughs> happened, there was a few comments made. One by the, the sheriff of Los Angeles. He said that the curfew should be abolished. He says, take the babysitting job out of the hands of the police, put it in the hands of the parents. If the parents think their kids can be out after 10, they should be out. Most everybody that was there says that the vandalism was caused by kids in their very late, like 18, 19, 20, and 21, like that age kid. The only people representing the kids are the kids themselves. Not, but they're not kids care. talking for kids because kids are only kids, you know, and they go through this vicious cycle. Authority does. I'm being very general because I don't want to, like, call names or anything. The reason I haven't spoken all this time is because the, it doesn't matter what I say, nobody will listen to me because I'm under 21. <laughs> so I'm just keeping my mouth shut. And that's the kind of thing they would do on a regular basis, so. Yay. Thank you. Thank you.